I want to talk to you today about God's curse on Bible corruptors. All right, this is going to be a very important subject. Um, I don't think I've ever done an actual dedicated sermon on the warnings in the King James Bible uh, about perverting the Word of God. And um, we'll get into the study here. Let's begin in Revelation chapter 22. I'm going to be saying a lot of things in here, so don't jump to conclusions and start writing comments before you listen to the whole study. Um, we're going to cover a lot of the arguments. Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the, pro of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. All right. Um, now. There's a whole lot to say about this particular passage, okay? Um, and let me begin by saying very strongly that I do believe and teach in eternal security. Uh, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. Uh, certainly, absolutely. You can go all throughout the Pauline epistles. It teaches eternal security. So, what's this about? Now, there's a couple ways to handle this passage. Number one, you can just simply push it off into the millennial kingdom and say, okay, well... Uh, we have eternal security now, and they don't in the, in the millennial kingdom because of this verse there or going into eternity or some kind of thing like this. Um, but then that makes, makes a problem because there's other verses of Scripture, which we will be covering in this study, that say similar things about being destroyed for messing with the Word of God. So, not a real strong argument. Um, and then you, know, you can say, you know, well, if it's just for people in the millennial kingdom or going out into eternity that they can't add to or take away f or uh, yeah, add to or subtract from the word of God, well, then I guess everybody else can in other dispensations. No, God's word is a lot more important than that. Uh, the other big argument that people will use, they'll say, well, see, when somebody uh, has their part taken out of the book of life, that means that it was once in. Obviously, we can all agree to that. So they say, well, then that proves that everybody at one point in time had their name in the book of life and later it's removed. Uh, well, that's a problem because there's a lot of people that, you know, die and go to hell and eventually lake of fire and they didn't corrupt the Bible. So, you know, how do they have their part taken out of the book of life? Uh, that's a problem. Um, I believe that this is a very serious warning, probably the most serious warning in the entire Bible about having your part taken out of the book of life. And if you read over in Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, you can go there real quick, just a page or two back. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So if you have your part taken out of the book of life, um, you're going into the lake of fire. It's just as simple as that. And you say, well... Um, you know, another thing is they'll say, well, see, it's, it says uh, taken out of the book of life. Well, that, they were never really in it. Uh, well, that doesn't work either. I mean, if I say, here's my Bible, and I'm going to take these notes out of my Bible. They had to be in the Bible before I can take them out of the Bible. It's not that they were never in it. All right. So what's going on there in Revelation chapter 22? Well, I believe it's dealing with a purposeful, changing, corrupting of the Word of God based on other scriptures, which we're going to be covering, changing the Word of God purposefully and then saying this is God's Word. You are effectively calling yourself God at that point in time. You know, the, the scriptures are given by inspiration of God. The Holy Spirit spake by holy men, you know, and things the Bible talks about. Um, the Holy Spirit is the one that inspires the scriptures. So, you know, you talk about the blasphemy of the Holy you know, Ghost and things there. Blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Well, what greater blasphemy is there than to say these words that I've written down with my own mind and my own opinions are God's words? It's a very serious sin. Okay? But uh, let me before I go on there, let me just make a point. All right? Grab something here quick. Here I have two different Greek texts. The one in my right hand is a Textus Receptus. The one in my left hand is a Nestle's text. These aren't the same Greek text. You say, well, the Bibles, all Bibles come from the same source. No, they don't. No, they don't. This one comes from Egypt. 
primarily. I mean, you can get into all the little arguments and things. Well, some of the manuscripts, I know, I know. But primarily, this one is an Alexandrian text. This one is a Syrian from Antioch. All right, this is the critical text. This is the received text. This one has the vast majority of manuscripts, extant Greek manuscripts. In other words, extant that they've been looked at and, and they're in a museum or some other place. 99% line up here. Less than 1% line up here. This is the one used by the Jehovah's Witnesses. All new versions and the Vatican. This is the one used by the Greek Orthodox Church and Bible believers. Okay? They're not the same. They're not used by the same people. It's very important to understand that. And... Uh, what did we just read there in Revelation chapter 22? We read that you're not to take away any part of, if any man shall take away you know, from the words of the prophecy of this book. And that's another thing people say, well, it's not about the whole Bible, it's just about the book of Revelation. Okay? Well, then there would be no other verses in Scripture warning about messing with other Scriptures. But there are, which we will be covering. But let's just go with this, this thinking for a minute here, that it's only the book of Revelation don't, you know, if it, take away from the words of the prophecy of this book. Okay, it's talking about Revelation. Okay? Let's go with that for just a minute here. Let me put this Receptus down. Here, you go back to the back and you have the last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation. And you go down here, up here. Let me come in here closer so you can see this thing. Up here, you have the Greek text. Down here, this is called the critical apparatus. Okay, this is where the different manuscripts, different designations for different manuscripts. Now, I'll just kind of show you here, kind of zoom in as best as I can. You'll notice that there's a letter, there's no letter B in there. Okay, because there's a manuscript that's designated by the letter B. Codex B, all right? Vaticanus is what it's known as. Let me just show you here, just to show you I'm not doing anything, any monkey business here or whatever. All right, right here, right before it we have, there's a B, see my fingers pointing? Okay, and there's a B, and here is a B, right there with my fingers pointing. Okay. In other words, these particular passages, this verse and that verse, is found in the Vaticanus manuscript. All right. What's my point? You can go the whole way through the book of Revelation. There's no references to B in the critical apparatus that I'm aware of. Why? Because the Vaticanus manuscript removes the entire book of Revelation. Now, I think that God would have kind of a problem when he says, just going with this teaching that, you know, the warning in Revelation 22, 18, and verses 18 and 19 is only in reference to the book of Revelation. Let's just go with that for a minute. Um, I think the Lord would have a problem when, an when a codex there, codex B, entire manuscript, removes the entire book. They're not even taking away from words or adding words or whatever. The entire book is gone. And yet, the vast majority of manuscripts, you look down at the footnotes, it'll say, not in the two oldest and best manuscripts, not in the two oldest and best manuscripts. They might even name Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, or Vaticanus or Sinaiticus. Or, you know, people get all upset with me if I say the word the way that they didn't learn it in their little college, their Bible college someplace. I really could care less how it's said. But the whole point is, um, God warns about taking away or adding to the words of the book of this prophecy. And if you want to make that the book of Revelation, um, the Vaticanus manuscript removes the entire book. Um, what do you think God thinks of that? And what do you think of God, or what do you think, how do you think God feels towards a Bible version that is, that is you know, based on that corrupt text? Let me show you something else here. Here in the introduction. I guess that's page 45. And I've showed this in many studies, but I'll just show you again here if you're new to this whole thing. There you go. This text is made under the supervision of the Vatican. See it? Isn't that something? 
I guess that's coming out. I can't really see too good here. And if that's not enough for you, let me go over here, show you one of the fine scholars that worked on this fine Greek text that we can trust and it's, it's reliable and, and everything else. Um, I'll go to this other page, it's a little bit clearer over here. Carlo M. Martini, a Jesuit cardinal in the Roman Catholic Church. And he put this thing together. And the introduction tells you that it's made under the supervision of the Vatican. Hmm. You think that that could actually be uh, lining up with the curse in Revelation 22, verse 18 through 19? I would say so. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you're out there and you think to yourself, well, you know, yeah, I believe the King James Bible. It's my preferred Bible. It's the only one I use. But, uh, you know, I've seen some good videos from people out there. And, yeah, they use the new versions. But, um, okay. You, know, you better check yourself. Let me tell you that. You better check yourself. You better check your relationship with the Lord because it's not right right now. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm saying your relationship is not right. You can get out of fellowship with the Lord as a saved Christian. And, you know, we all have a tendency to start getting a little bit lukewarm. And I'll tell you what, the Bible version issue is a very easy place for you to get lukewarm. You start to say, well, you know, yeah, okay, they, people use these new versions and they don't really know any better. Uh, I got rebuked the one time about that. And uh, actually, a dear sister in the Lord, she, she didn't you know, try to usurp my authority or anything like that. Not a female preacher, but she just gently said, Brother, um, don't make excuses for people that use the new versions. If you want to know about the Bible version issue, you can learn everything you need to know in minutes nowadays. The books that are written, the videos that have been made, the articles, everything. The Holy Spirit of truth can guide you into that truth like that nowadays so these people well i'm a christian but i still use the new versions you're not right with god you're not right with god and if you as a king james bible believing christian are starting to mess around listening to these people you are listening to people that use an accursed text i mean you know when you read something in the bible that says hey if you take away from the words of the book of this prophecy your parts taken out of the book of life you'd think that that should inspire a little bit of fear there a little bit of reverence and say Whoa, don't mess with the book. And this isn't somebody just quoting a verse of Scripture and you don't quote it word for word and you, you mix it up in your head or whatever else. You didn't just lose your salvation, okay? This is talking about a concerted effort to sit down and rewrite the Bible and call it God's holy word. Knowing that you're deceiving people. Knowing that you're using a corrupted text. Okay? Very, very serious. People have this idea that God's just a big teddy bear and things. The Bible says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. That's saved Christians saying that. Do you look at God as, as a terrible God? One that's worthy of terror? You know, inspires terror and things? Oh, wow. He's my buddy. We're going to run up to, I see him in heaven and we're going to run up and we're going to hug and I'm going to say, oh, Jesus, and he's going to hug me, hold me close. That's not what John sees. John, the book of Revelation, he's fallen down at his feet. Jesus, you know, John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. Yeah. Reverence. He's a king. You don't mess with him and you don't mess with the one physical possession that we have that is supernatural. The book. Do you realize people died for that book? So that you could have it in your hands today? What place does this book have in your life? How important is it? Would you be willing to die for it? Things you better think about. And uh, you better be afraid of changing it. I'm not dare going to change a book change this book, change a word in this book. I'm not dare going to say, well, actually, I don't like the way this says it here, so I'm going to kind of just change this a little bit. 
and you look at these new versions, they say, it's more accurate. It's more accurate. They're all more accurate. More accurate. And then you study it and they're, they're putting in brothers and sisters and the Greek word for sisters is nowhere in the text. They're inserting it because of political correctness and gender inclusivity. And they'll, they'll just lie. It's more accurate. More accurate. We, re, we replace uh, mankind with human beings or some kind of thing like this. They're doing it all the time. Their own corrupt Nestle's text doesn't even support the changes in a lot of these modern versions. I mean, it's, it's not even just, you know, Syrian versus, you know, Alexandria and Egyptian text. It's now, there is no manuscript support to underlie the changes that these new versions are bringing out. There's none. And these people just have no fear at all. I'll tell you what, God's curse is upon them. Let's continue. Next, we're going to go to that back to the book of Deuteronomy. You see, well, the warning about changing Scripture is only there in Revelation. Ain't wrong. You're going to want to write these verses down because these are important verses. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4. This, this thing is all through the Bible. You don't mess with this book. All right? You need to have some reverence for this book. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2. Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. I mean, you know, if somebody gets uh, direct orders from the Lord and they come along to you and they say, hey, I got some direct orders from the Lord. And you say, really, what is it? He told me to give you this word for word. And uh, you say, oh, okay. And you, I, I, let me write this down and things. And they say, Boy, you know what? I forget what it was. I think it was something about, you know, go to a, a store in your local town and get a pound of hamburger. I think that's what it was. That's close enough. That's close enough. You'd say, uh, no. If he said it's exact orders, I want to know exactly what he said. Don't paraphrase it. Don't just give me, an, an, a, a, you know, your thoughts on that. I want to know what he said. And yet you have people who profess to be Christian today and they say, I don't want a literal word for word translation. That doesn't matter to me. I'll just give me a paraphrase like the Message Bible or just dynamic equivalence. You know, you have in the Bible translation world, you have formal equivalence, which is trying to get as close to word for word as you can. And then you have dynamic equivalence, which is more of a thought for thought. <laughs> you know, yeah, like you can trust that. I mean, it's insane. Don't you want to know exactly what the Lord said? Oh, we'll just get some scholars' opinions and things. Uh, yeah, where did that come from? Oh, yeah, um, somebody saying that uh, a certain church, I should say, saying that uh, reading the Bible by itself is dangerous. You should have the church to interpret it for you. Hmm. No connection, I'm sure. Psalm 107. Psalm 107, verses 11 through 12. Because they rebelled against the words of God and condemned the counsel of the Most High, therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. I love that. You know, I know people that go to modern churches. They have whole groups of people that are on antidepressants and all kinds of things, having all kinds of mental problems, trying to commit suicide all the time. They're falling apart. Isn't that interesting? But they have, a, they have an easier to understand Bible. We can't read the King James Bible because it's too old and archaic. So we have these easy to understand Bibles. They got the new trendy hip look, looking covers. And, and we have our neat little Bible studies where we just all sit around and talk about our feelings. And yet they're falling down and they can't help themselves. They're falling apart. Why? <laughs> they have an easier to understand Bible. And a lot of these devils out there that stand for the new versions, they'll come out and they'll say, it's, it's, it's a sin almost. I mean, they almost say it's a sin to use the King James Bible because it can't communicate to, to people, you know, to people today. It's insane. It's insanity. You say, okay, let's just go with that for a minute. Then that means your new versions are communicating. Where's the revival? Where's the fruit that comes from the new versions? I can tell you the fruit that comes from the King James Bible. We can look back at 400 years of history. Over 400 years now. 407 years actually to be precise 407 years of history 
showing you the fruit of the King James Bible. What's the fruit of the new versions? Countries just falling apart. Why? Because they didn't continue. They didn't stand for the Word of God. They're ashamed of it. Go next to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 13. So, oh, he's getting into numerology. No, the Bible has a system of numbers. Okay, and you don't have to be a real deep student of Scripture to understand that. Read the book of Revelation sometime, and you'll see seven this, seven that. Okay, six, six, six. Six is the number of man. Yeah, the Bible has a system of numbers. And you look at 13, it's a cursed number. So what would Proverbs chapter 13, verse 13 say? I wonder what it would say. Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed, but he that feareth the commandment shall be rewarded. Now look at that. Do you despise the word? Well, this King James Bible, I mean, it's, it's, it was good for people in the past, but today, we, it's just no good for people today. It just, it just can't speak to people. And it doesn't have the proper, you know, another one of these wingnut groups out there, these stupid Hebrew roots people. I'm not talking about Jews. I'm talking about these wicked devils, be they white or black or whatever they are. And they're coming out saying, we're the Jews, man. We're the true Jews. Yeah, uh -huh. And we can't, we can't read the King James Bible because it says Jesus. And it should be Yeshua or Yahushua or Yamahawawashi or what, you know, stupid nonsense. What are they doing? They despise the word. The word Jesus, the name Jesus, has power to it. And they don't like that. So they have to come up with these mystical sounding, you know, all these fancy words, you know, or something. They despise the word. What's the future for them? Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed. God's curse is upon them. So curse, curse, I don't know if I like this curse stuff. Well, then you don't read much Bible and you don't know history. God has poured out his right, righteous indignation on nation after nation after nation because they mess with this book. And you look at the time when America really started to go downhill morally, it was when the new versions came in. 1901, American Standard Version. All of a sudden you get Federal Reserve and the, the New Deal with FDR and your gold's taken from you and you get the fake currency. So now your, your wealth is just inflated paper, you know? And then you start having all the other things coming in. Two world wars come in. Oh, but that's just coincidence. You know, it's just a coincidence. The, the new versions got started here. You know, the, the you know, higher textual criticism, natural textual criticism with Brooke Foss, Westcott, and Fenton, Jan Anthony, Fent, Fenton John Anthony Hort. I'll get it out. You know, over in the UK. And they came out with their revised version in 1881. And, and uh, you know, and then later on it came to America, to the shores of America. And, and then you had all these... King James Bible using preachers like uh, Charles Haddon Spurgeon and John R. Rice and everything else. And they'd use the King James Bible, but they would correct it with the American Standard Version. A lot of the people back then did that. It became very trendy to say, well, a better reading would be. The Greek word here should be better translated as. And so for the most of the 20th century, the worst century in history, I would say, except maybe before the flood in the days of Noah, but the most, the bloodiest century, the most just morals just went just off a cliff. And it was what, what was the, the fruit there? What was, what, was, what was it that caused it? New version after new version, American Standard Version, Revised Standard Version. And then you had new American Standard Version. Oh boy. And then you had, you know, and a lot of different uh, J.B. Phillips and a, a lot of these other guys coming out with their own little, things in the living bible by kenneth taylor and and all these little paraphrases and and, and this is better and, and whatever else and i showed i think i have it in one of my videos uh jb phillips in his one of his footnotes he said this is probably either a slip on the on the pen of paul or a copyist error and this whole terminology came out of the universities and made it into the churches a better rhetoric would be the original would have said uh, this is just a translation. No translation can be inspired. And all this stuff. And the mighty revivals and the mighty, the, the strong, you know, Christian churches out there. And I don't mean church buildings. I mean groups of Christians. The strong movement of the Holy Spirit in America just went pff, out. It's like somebody just dumped a bunch of water on it. And just, pff, 
just sizzled, gone. By the time you hit 1973 with the new, uh, the, uh, new international version, 73 it officially you know, was being worked on, 74 is when they came out with the first New Testament. You have Roe versus Wade, abortions legalized. And just corruption and corruption and corruption and corruption. And today's New International Version comes out in 2001. What happened in 2001? Oh yeah, September the 11th. Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed. And, boy, well, they've stopped now though, right? No, they, they just keep going on and on and on. It's just like evolution philosophy. And it, and it is evolution philosophy too, I might add. The new versions are tied to evolution philosophy. Evolution says things get better with time. See? What's the new versions? What's their philosophy? They get better with time. You say, have you arrived at a perfect Bible yet? Not yet. But we will possibly someday, perhaps maybe. <laughs> the English language is constantly in a state of, of change, and, and so we have to constantly change the Word of God. That's what's going on. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5. What I was saying about the thing of evolution, um, the thing with evolution is, you know, you have Ernst Haeckel comes out with his ridiculous stuff on embryology, you know, what back in the late 1800s, I believe it was. Um, Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. I, I memorized that because it's just so stupid. I like to say it occasionally just to remind myself how dumb evolutionists were in the past and are today as well. But uh, comes out and he shows and he, he, you know, makes it look like the development of the embryo of a, of a person, of a man, you know, mankind, I'll say it that way. Um, the development of, I don't use the word human, but, uh, you know, this development of the embryo, is, it shows how evolution happened. How we start out as a little blob and then we become a fish-like creature. And, then, and he was just faking the whole thing. <laughs> it's not even true. And he was, he was tried and, and everything else. You had the Piltdown hoax, you know, the Piltdown man and all this other stuff. Catholic, it was, I think it was a Catholic priest or something involved in the whole thing. I mean, it's just ridiculous. And evolution has been proved wrong again and again and again. And yet they still teach it. Why? Because there's no substitute. And the other side of the coin is teaching intelligent design or creation. And they, oh, we can't do that because then people would start thinking that there's a God and then they would stop acting like animals. See? That's the whole thing. You can't stop teaching these new versions and, and saying that, you know, this, this whole lie of uh, better manuscripts and whatever else. I just, I showed you at the beginning there, better manuscripts, Vaticanus removes the entire book of Revelation. It's a cursed manuscript. And by the way, another little interesting thing about Vaticanus, no Protestant scholar was ever able to examine the whole thing. You're given copies from the Vatican. So, you know, these new versionists, they come out. I've dealt with these people for years and years and years, long before I was even on YouTube. They come out and they say, where was the Bible before 1611? <laughs> you know, uh, which is ridiculous. We don't teach that the Bible just started in 1611. Uh, it was all over the place in different languages and things like that. It's just the Lord said, okay, here's the Bible for the end times. Made the greatest translation ever in the history of man, King James Bible. I can prove that. <laughs> It's a scientifically verifiable fact by simply showing no book has been printed as much as this King James Bible. Greatest selling, greatest, most published, most printed book in the entire history of the world. So yeah, it's the best book ever. But, uh, you know, um, but uh, I forget what point I was trying to make now. <laughs> but, you know, they come out with these new versions all the time and they, they try to take down the King James Bible. And again, I, I've said this in other studies and things, you know, you look at the preface, they'll almost always compare themselves to the King James Bible. And they'll just, rele you know, it's, it's just, re you know, relegated to the ash heap. It's just kind of, it's old and whatever else and things, you know, sure. But uh, they, I know what I was going to say. They come out and they say, where was the Bible before 1611? Well, here's a good question to ask them. Where was the Bible before the Vatican gave you a copy of Codex B to make your new version translation from? Huh. You mean to tell me that uh, God would wait until the 1800s and then have the Vatican release the best, oldest manuscript, Codex B, because Sinaiticus is very shaky? Uh, you know, again, there's a whole thing on that. I believe a lot of what David Daniels has come out with recently, that Codex uh, Sinaiticus, Aleph, as it's called, um, 
I believe that that thing was a forgery. I think it was. I think he's proved his case very well. It shows the different, different pages of the thing, and some are darker than other ones, and lighter and things. They were dying them, you know? Things of forgery. So we'll leave Codex Sinaiticus out of it, but, you know, Vaticanus. Uh, these new versions are being made from copies of Vaticanus that are handed out by the Vatican, the enemy of Bible-believing Christians. But you can go there and you can get your Bible from them, your new version from that. Or as a, you can say, well, I use the King James Bible, but I like to listen occasionally to people that use these new versions. They come from the Vatican. Hope by the end of this study you get a little bit of fear into you. Proverbs chapter 30, verses 5 through 6. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. It's funny because these people, uh, they come out with their new versions and their new Bible, you know, oh, it's updated and everything else. And you actually start to look at their updatings and where it's made clearer and whatever else. And you realize they're messing up this book like crazy. They're adding to the scriptures and contradicting the scriptures as a result. I have a whole bunch of videos out on the English Standard Version showing where they're adding things to the scriptures, just putting things in and changing words and whatever else, and they're messing up the, the whole doctrinal meaning of the passage. They're teaching false doctrine because of them adding to the scriptures. Why? Well, uh, because the Bible said that that's what would happen. Let's go on to the next one, Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 30 through 32. Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, He saith. Isn't that interesting? Verse 32. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. All these people out there, you know, well, I go to church and everything else, and they got all kinds of problems. They got all just, just terrible problems. Why? Well, because of these verses here. They go to some hireling out there who steals the words from them. He'll stand up in the pulpit and he'll say, the King James Bible is not God's inspired word. It's not God's perfect word. Yes, I make my living from it, and you, two peop you people are too stupid and too gullible to, to wake up to the scam that I'm running here. You know, I mean, you got a guy up in the pulpit that preaches from a book and he calls it God's word, and yet he doesn't believe it's God's perfect word. And I'm, and I'm called a nut or a kook or something like that because I believe it's God's word. It's insanity. People are crazy. That's why they have all the problems. God's not going to bless you if you don't believe this book. Not going to happen. You say, well, I can believe my new version. No, you can't. It comes from a cursed source. I mean, you know, you come along and you find some, here's this book there, this codex, and you say, wow, and you know, you've snuck into the Vatican's archives there or whatever, and there's the uh, Codex B, oh, you know, light comes out, oh, you know, on it and stuff, oh, boy, it's, oh, and you open the thing up and you go back to the book of Revelation, where's the book of Revelation? Oh, well, that doesn't matter. Who needs the book of Revelation? Why do we need that? What kind of people think this way? No, you look and you say, there's no book of Revelation here? They took the book of Revelation out? okay, I don't think I want anything to do with that book. You see, if you fear God, you'll do that. If you have no fear of God, you'll just say, eh, well, it's, you know, it's, it's, I love the way it's, I mean, it's written on vellum. It's a lamb skin here. I love the, the, the font and the way that the yard is really. And it's, it's so old and so in such pristine condition. I guess that's because nobody with any sense would have used it. I mean, how do you know? How do you know? Back in the 19th century there, with Constantine von Tischendorf, he 
finds the Sinaiticus manuscript in St. Catherine's Monastery, and he says, look at this, I found this 4th century codex. Oh, it's, an, it's so exciting and everything else. Yes, they were going to use it for starting their trash, you know, their fire and things, you know, it was in the waste paper. But it's, it's valuable, you know. And everybody goes, oh, wow, we found older, better manuscripts than what the King James Bible is based on. Wow. And then all of a sudden the Vatican, you know, hey, um, here's Codex B. You know, uh, yeah, okay, that's a copy I want to give you. Here you go. <laughs> and all the Christians go, wow, older and better manuscripts. What a blessing. <laughs> I mean, idiocy. And how many uh, preachers from back then switched over to the new versions as a result of that nonsense? Proverbs chapter 23, verse 36. Jump down to verse 36 there. And the burden of the Lord shall ye mention no more, for every man's word shall be his burden. For ye have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord of hosts, our God. The burden of the Lord shall ye mention no more, for every man's word shall be his burden. Oh, you, you want your new versions, do you? You want your uh, better updated, more easy to understand, paraphrase? Okay, then it's your words. Hey, uh, Lord, could you, could you lead me down this path here? And the Lord says to you, find your own way. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'll just walk down through. I'll be just be blindfolded and walk down through here. Not if you have any sense. If you have any sense, you'll say, uh, no, Lord, I, I want you. I want your words. I want your help. I don't want to diminish anything from it. You tell me what to do, I'm going to do it. But, oh, oh, no, we can't because we have to have a new version that's easier for people to understand. The Lord says, okay, there's your new version. It's your words now. You perverted mine, so you stick with your words. Hey there, modern church that wants your little positive, practical Christianity, you got it. You know, people say, why do the wicked prosper? You know, it's in the Bible. Why do the wicked prosper? Because God lets them have what they want. God, we don't want some old book, some old archaic book that tells us things that are uncomfortable, that don't fit in with our modern politically correct society. I don't want that book. I think it should be reworded to be kind of a little bit less offensive and so we don't offend the sodomites and so we don't offend the female rights people, the feminists and things. I don't want to offend people. And the Lord says, okay, write your book. You're under my curse. Have a nice day. But it's safe for you to dabble in that as a Christian. I use the King James Bible, brother, and I listen to the King James Bible, but you know, I've seen some pretty good videos out there with people using new versions, and, and you know, I personally wouldn't use new versions, but if they do and I can learn something, I can glean something. <laughs> the new versions are satanic. The Holy Spirit of God is not going to inspire anyone to use a new version. Jeremiah chapter 26. We'll go there. Get off. A little B on my Bible there. Thus saith the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak unto all the cities of Judah which come to worship in the Lord's house. All the words that I command thee to speak unto them diminish not a word. If so be, they will hearken and turn every man from his evil way, that I may repent me of the evil which I purpose to do unto them because of the evil of their doings. And thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, if ye will not hearken to me, to walk in my law which I have set before you, to hearken to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I sent unto you, both rising up early and sending them, but ye have not hearkened. Then will I make this house like Shiloh, and will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. You know what America was at one point in time? It was a godly nation. Why? Because people came here to get away from the Roman Catholic system over in Europe. That's why. This was a great nation. Not perfect. I'm not saying it was. But it was a great nation at one point in time. Because they were nonconformists that came here. And by the way, a lot of the nonconformists got along with the Native American people that were here. They came and they were trading with them and things. They weren't just coming in and killing them and slaughtering them and things. That was the papists that were doing that. Guarantee you. I guarantee you. You do go back and you do all the research and things, you'd see it was a papist. Yeah. But what is America today? 
it's a curse to all the other nations out there. I heard the one time that uh, saw this documentary about the Vietnam War, and they were talking about Viet to the Vietnamese people, and the and the, they said the American War. <laughs> you know, I thought that was kind of funny. You know, the American War. We go over there and we invade their country, and things were killing people and slaughtering people and destroying their whole country and everything else. They said, well, that was the American War. They didn't call it the Vietnam War. They called it the American War. I thought that was pretty funny. <clears throat> Not funny for the people, but you know what I'm saying. Mark chapter 8. Vietnam was a drug war. By the way, if you haven't figured that out yet, it was about drugs. And that's not my thoughts on the matter. That's uh, men like Colonel James Bo Greitz, uh, the guy that the Rambo movies were made after. And he went over and he said about, uh, you know, he talked to General Kun Sa over there. And um, I have the video in my collection. And uh, talks to the guy, and the guy said, yeah, the heroin trade, it's, it's uh, your government that's involved with it. George Bush Sr. and Richard Armitage and a lot of these guys. Yeah, it's about heroin. And uh, you're not going to get the POWs back, the POW MIA guys back, over 2,200 of them. You're not going to get them back because it's all just bargaining stuff, you know, and, and the, the Vietnamese government was saying, hey, we'll give them back if you give, pay reparations for what you did to our country. Nope, sorry, we don't want them back. That's, you know, over 2,000, over 2,200 soldiers, you know, just leave them there. Nah, nah, sorry. You know. Mark chapter 8, verse 38. There's a whole lot of stuff I could say here, but. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him also shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the, whole, in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Yeah, it's so funny because they say, What's the big thing with the new version people? They say, well, there's, people are, are sinful and, they're, and they're, they're messed up with things. They need to have God's word in a more modern form. How can we go and talk to people that are on the street that are messed up with their drug addicts or whatever else and give them this archaic English? Well, you mean, uh, whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this, this adulterous and sinful generation, and you're ashamed of the words of God? You say, well, I shouldn't say thee or, you know, withholdeth or, you know, chaste conversation or something like this or, you know, suffereth long or I shouldn't say those things. Why? They're ashamed of God's word. And so they go and they change the word of God and God says, okay, you're under my curse. America today is a cursed nation. Why? Because the vast majority of professing Christians are not even using God's Word anymore. They're using man-made Bible versions that go back to the Vatican, a cursed text that removed the entire book of Revelation. And that's the foundation by which they make their new translation. Wonder why God's not blessing this country. And people say, well, God still is blessing this country. Okay, indentured slave. If you call your life a blessing from God, you are deceived. John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 43. One of these great places of Scripture to take one of these modern Christians to. You know, by the way, Mark chapter 8, verse 38, the same basic thing as in Luke chapter 9, verse 26. But you get these modern Christians, they come out and they say, you know, Jesus was loving and he didn't ever attack anybody and he just, he didn't judge people. Okay, John chapter 8, verse 43 through 47. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? Get a hold of this one. He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. I just don't understand that archaic language of the King James Bible. Well, then you're not saved. You're not saved. People had no, un no problem understanding it back in the 1800s, back in the 1700s when they didn't have all the uh, <coughs> education, <coughs> excuse me, that people do today. And they could read it and understand it just fine. 
Why? Because there was a reverential fear of the book. People didn't look at this book and say it should be changed. It needs to be updated. It's no good for us to use with modern man. They knew it was God's book. And they believed it was God's book. You say, what about the Geneva? God didn't use the Geneva the way he used the King James Bible. And it wasn't, you know, King James, uh, you know, him, the first of England, you know, he, he's not the one that was, by his decree, he was the one that was publishing it and putting it out there. This book became famous because of God's people, because of the body of Christ, preaching and teaching from this book, carrying this book out into the wilderness, circuit riding preachers of the 1800s, going out and preaching this book. And they weren't going out and saying, I'm here to tell you folks today that a better translation would be, Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to talk to you about the Word of God. Now, when I say Word of God, I, of course, don't mean this book right here because we know that it's not inspired. <laughs> huh? No, they preached with it, with, from it with the conviction that this is God's book, that this is the Word of God. John chapter 12, verse 48. I mean, you know, I know that there was some Hollywood movie years ago, something with Jim Carrey in it or something like this. I stopped watching Hollywood movies, you know, many, many years ago. But I remember hearing something about this, this thing, a liar or something like this, and, and something about that his boy wished it. I remember seeing previews for it. Something about his boy wished that he had to tell the truth or something, and, and he told the truth through the movie, and it was so embarrassing and whatever else. Uh, would it be something if God would do that to a Christian? Or, you know, I'll say it this way, God would do it to a modern preacher. <laughs> I mean, you imagine a modern preacher standing up in the pulpit, or even a lot of the Baptists out there. The, most Baptist pastors I've ever met, um, they do not believe the King James Bible is God's perfect book. They call that a heresy. You know, I recently heard that uh, Eric Phelps, Eric John Phelps came out, um, and he said that, uh, I heard his radio program, and he said that uh, to say that King James Bible um, Bible is God's perfect inspired word is a damnable heresy. And yet that's all he uses on his program. It's the Greek Textus Receptus. That's the God inspired. Okay, then read from that, Eric. It's weird. Really, really weird. But can you imagine if God forced one of these modern preachers to be honest and stand up there and he'd say, stand up and say, okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm going to preach to you today out of this King James Bible. Honestly, I don't really believe it. Um, it's got a lot of errors in it. Uh, I've a, I'm actually a believer in the Texas Receptus, but I can't read it. And, you know, I have to translate it anyhow, so I'm too lazy to do that. So I'm just going to kind of read my way through this book here. And, and um, it's not inspired. It's not really the Word of God. Uh, it's got a lot of errors in it and things and areas where it should be retranslated and whatever else. But, uh, oh, let's, let's pass the tithe around. <laughs> pass, pass the plate around. Give your 10%, which isn't in Scripture, but, you know, that's okay because I'm just conning you people. Most of you are too stupid and whatever else and brainwashed, and we give you the little social thing, social club while you're here, and everybody smiles and is nice, but I'm just scamming you for your money. You know, can you imagine? Because that's really what they believe. That's really what a lot of these guys believe. That's what they teach. Preaching to them is a career. That's all it is. You know, the Lord brought me out of logging, brought me out of wood turning, brought me out of working and called me into the ministry. I didn't leave high school and say, I just got to be a preacher and I'm going to go to the university and, you know, hopefully I won't get my fingernails dirty. <laughs> now I'm a worker. OK, and I still work. All right. I still cut trees down. I still build things. I still work very, very hard when I'm not doing my video ministry. I still work on vehicles and things like that. But a lot of these preachers I know, they are pansies, sissies, effeminate little girls is what they are. They don't know anything about hard labor. Oh, unless they help to set up a picnic table at the church social. <laughs> or help to remodel the church building. Then, that, then they get, might get their hands dirty a little bit. They're con artists. Just disgusting. John chapter 12, verse 48. 
He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Hmm. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Almost like Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 through 19. And you get up there and the Lord says, uh, you added to my word and you subtracted from it. Bye-bye. Oh, Brother Brian, you're so stupid. You're so ridiculous and everything else. Uh, I'm, I don't think it's a big deal to change the King James Bible. I don't think it's a big deal. We can you know, kind of have fun. Have fun. I am not idiotic enough to say that I'm going to just have some fun and change the book whenever I feel you know, that I need to change it. I'm just going to change the Word of God and, and whatever. And, and I'll be all right. I am not that crazy. I'm not that crazy. I take this Bible for what it means. And that gets me in a lot of trouble with a lot of people. There's no church buildings in this book. Okay? No church buildings. This Bible doesn't say that a Christian should be in debt. Go borrow money and whatever else. So I'm not going to go borrow money. I'm not going to be in debt. There's a whole lot of things. This Bible does not say go get a state marriage license. That the government should have any part of marriage. So I don't have a state marriage license. And I will never get a state marriage license. And on and on and on. So many things. This book is God's book. You say, which one? This King James Bible that I'm holding in my hands right here. You say, but yes, but is it 1611 or 1769? I don't care. It's this one right here. It's a 1769 too, by the way. I have a whole video on that thing. People get too picky and things and whatever else. and Whatever. This book. This is the book I've preached out of now for many, many, many years. In and out of church buildings too, I might add. This thing's laid on the pulpit of many Baptist churches. I'm not some kind of an outsider or some nut that walks around in the woods and never been around other people and things. Like a lot of people try to make me out to be. Romans chapter 1, verse 20. A lot of people hate me because they know I'm right. You don't uh, hate somebody on the level that people hate me uh, if that person's just in total error. Romans chapter 1, verse 20 through 25. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, <laughs> being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. I'm a scholar, I'm a PhD, I'm a THD, I'm, you know, whatever. And change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Isn't it interesting that the new virgins brought in sex perversion? You say, oh, no, no. It's just coincidence. Just a coincidence. You go back 100 years ago, people would, would have dragged a sodomite out into the streets and you know, probably beat him to death or something. I'm not saying that that was the right thing to do, but it was illegal. Okay? That's sodomy laws. Not only that, they had anti-miscegenation laws. You couldn't even get interracially married in this country. It would have been against the law 100 years ago. What happened? Well, the Word of God is just too archaic. We don't understand anymore, so we have to come out with our new versions. Hmm. Leads to sex perversion. Verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Change the word of God into a lie. It's funny because the new versions will cover up their own sin. They'll say, exchanged it for a lie. That's not what the Bible says. Changed into a lie. They're adding to. They're subtracting from. They're perverting the words of God. That's what these new versions do. They're changing it into a lie. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. The words of man will contradict. The words of God will not. Let's continue. 2 Corinthians chapter 2.
2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God speak we in Christ. We are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Huh, Paul? No, no. It's only a recent thing. It's the only recent thing that people were corrupting the Word of God. No, it wasn't. Man has always been very wicked. You know, there are times when things have been better and whatever else, but man has always been a sinner. Man has always been wicked. And even in the first century, before the Bible's even finished, they're already corrupting the Word of God. Isn't that crazy? I'll show you an example of that. Second Thessalonians. Go to the book of Second Thessalonians. Chapter 2. I'll show you an example of people corrupting the Word of God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now, I be, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, nor be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. By letter, as from us? They're being troubled. By people sending forged letters, writing Paul's name on there? Yeah. There have always been servants of Satan out there that have no fear of God, and they will readily change his word and get his curse upon them. You know why the Vatican is such a cursed place? You know why the Vatican is filled with the most evil, vile, sex perverts out there? Because they corrupt the Word of God more than anyone else. Say, oh, the canon of Scripture came from the Catholic Church. No, it didn't. No, it didn't. The canon of Scripture came from the Scriptures itself in terms of you're not going to see the apocryphal books being referenced anywhere in the Word of God. And early Christian groups that go on back through before that predate the Catholic Church, uh, a lot of those early Christian groups, they had complete Bibles. And the Catholic Church comes along and they say, Oh, okay, well, we'll, uh, we'll take those Bibles and we'll just kill the heretics and, and then we'll just claim, oh, look, look, we give you the Bible. Hey, you know, and, and things. That's what's going on. And again, you know, I, I cannot cover this whole subject here, you know, in this little video here. I can't cover the whole thing. But you look back at the, the old Latin Vulgate and a lot of the older ones that were there before Jerome's Latin Vulgate and a lot of these other new, you know, again, old Latin Vulgate, new Jerome's Latin Vulgate, new version. You see, they did it way back then, fourth century. <laughs> Nothing's really changed. And a lot of these new, new updated readings came out in 1610 in the Dewey Reams Bible, before the King James Bible was completed a year later in 1611. Can I have a whole video proving that? Showing where a lot of these new version, oh, it's, we just have new, it's not new. It's the same stuff that the Catholic Church has brought out down through the centuries. It's the same corrupted perversions of Scripture that these people bring out. It's a war. Okay, do you understand that? There's a war for the Word of God. You better get on one side or the other, right? And if you're smart, if you're saved, you're going to get on the side of the King James Bible. And you're not going to say and take a light attitude towards people that use new versions find that so disturbing. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5 perfectly describes naturalistic textual criticism, a higher, higher textual criticism, the Alexandrian school of thought. Check this out. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing. You ever see these new version scholars and things like a James White and these, these other guys like that? They are so prideful. They're proud. And what do they know? Nothing. But doting about questions and strifes of words. Questions and strifes of words? The King James only controversy. I'll come out with my book and say, I'm not attacking the King James Bible, but here's a bunch of things that attack the King James Bible. <laughs> Pull a little bit of sophistry there, a little Jesuit sophistry. I'm not attacking the King James Bible. I've used the King James Bible. I know many of my friends love the King James Bible. But here's a book that attacks it and destroys it and will, and will basically wreck your faith in the King James Bible. 
<laughs> I'm not attacking it though. Yeah. Whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings. It's so funny. Strife. The King James Bible version issue is divisive. Um, no, the new versions are divisive. Okay, they're the ones that came along. The Alexandrian school of thought comes along. That's where division comes in. Those of us that want to stand by the word of God, the time honored and tested and true King James Bible, we want to stand by this book. We're not the ones dividing. Okay, we are not the ones that have a spirit of strife. That's the new version people. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth. What is the truth for a Christian? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. This is the truth. This is our standard. We do believe in absolute truth. But the people that make all these contentions and strivings about words and everything else, what are they? They're destitute of the truth. They don't have the truth in their life. It's their own opinions. And again, you get right down to it with these new version people. That's exactly what they have. They have their opinions. Nothing more. Oh, well, I believe that uh, the King James Bible is an error. Okay, um, what's a better Bible? Well, I believe in the ESV. I use the ESV, and, and for most of my Bible study work, I use the English Standard Version. And sometimes if I want a little bit more of a, a dynamic equivalent, I'll use the NIV or blah, blah, blah. Okay, uh, smarty pants, is it uh, perfect? No, no, no. It's a, just a translation. No translation can be inspired. No translation can be perfect. So, no. You say, okay, well, then what is God's perfect word? Well, the Greek, the underlying Greek and Hebrew. Okay, uh, what is the Greek that you use? Oh, well, I use the Nestles, the Nestle Lalande, or the United Bible Societies, or whatever else. Um, I use that. Okay, is it perfect? Uh, which one of your editions there? 28 editions that I know of so far. That one there I showed earlier is the 27th edition of the Nestles text. Is it perfect? Which one of the editions is perfect? Uh, in the sense of, it's finished, it's final, never needs to be updated. Oh, well, um, uh, there's a sense in which the, the work of updating the text is never going to be finished because we're always going to be finding new manuscripts and that's going to add to what we've known in the past and so we'll never really be finished. Okay, then what's God's perfect word? Well, the original autographs. Have you ever seen the original autographs? No. Okay, uh, God caught them up to heaven or some foolish nonsense like that. Uh, then what's your standard, really? Their preferences. And that's it. That's their standard. Their own feelings and opinions. Nothing more. They're proving 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. Interesting, isn't it? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. <clears throat> Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. You know, striving about words to no profit, all this uh, better rendering would be and a better text, and it's no profit. Just subverts the hearers. Leaves people confused. They go home saying, I don't really know for sure if this is wrong or that's wrong or we don't really know or whatever. When you rely on the words of men, you know, that's what you're going to end up with. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Um, how can you rightly divide the word of truth if you don't have it? I have the word of truth. Right there. You say, well, I don't agree. Okay, then use your words of men. You rely on your own little philosophies and things there to get you to heaven, possibly, maybe, but you're not really sure. <laughs> People are crazy. Finally, let's finish up in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Get back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 10. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe, as ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. 
For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God. Look at this. Which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Hmm. For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets, and have persecuted us, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men. Very true of the modern-day Jews as well. Uh, they return in unbelief, uh, and they're very wicked. <clears throat> God's not done with them. That's the time of Jacob's trouble coming up. Verse 16, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins alway, for the wrath has come upon them to the uttermost. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavor the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus our brother and minister of God and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know... For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. And I read down to that point for a very good reason. I hope that my labor hasn't been in vain. King James Video Ministries has been here now for over 10 years, preaching, teaching the Word of God. I have put my heart and soul into this ministry, and yet I see people... Followers of this ministry and things, friends of the ministry, I would say. And I'll see them sometimes and they're saying, hey, I was watching this video and it's, yeah, it's using new versions. And I'm thinking, have you learned nothing? Have you not learned a thing from me that these new versions are cursed? How many times have I held up a Texas Receptus and held up a Nestle's text and showed you that the Nestle's is from the Vatican? Oh, but some guy, he used a new version and it, maybe I don't agree totally, but he really brought out some good points. And I'm not singling any one person out. There's a lot of people that I get this from. A lot of people. Nobody alive today has any excuse for using these new versions. Even the most backwoods, out in the middle of nowhere, no access to the internet, no access to libraries or whatever else, the Holy Spirit of God is still there to convict them using a new version. And to say, this is my book right here, the King James Bible. This is the book. I'll tell you what. You better get a reverence in your life for the King James Bible, for God's written word, and say, I'm not going to add to it, I'm not going to subtract from it, because I fear what could happen to me if I do. And I'm not going to listen to anybody that uses a perversion that comes from the Vatican, the enemies of Jesus Christ. I'm not going to use a perversion. I'm just not going to do it. And if somebody reads it, somebody listen, you know, I'm listening to somebody or going to check into some ministry, and I see a new version... Boom. Done. Well, shouldn't I just check their doctrinal? No. Nope. Done. Boom. The Holy Spirit of God will not use the new versions. Ever. For any reason. I spent a long time collating the NIV and the TNIV, comparing it to the King James Bible. Looking up, I looked up uh, over 20,000 references. It took me a long time. I think it was probably over a year. It took me, a, you know, I don't remember the exact time it took me, but years and years ago when I did my from NIV to KJV study, uh, I had the collation. The collation is still on my website for free and things. You can go and you can look at all the different places where they've changed it and whatever else. Um, but I did that thing. And I can tell you right now, I felt a spirit. I could feel a very oppressive spirit when I was really digging deep into that NIV. And today, this very day, if I start to study that a new version to show that it's wicked in things, I can feel a spirit there. I can just feel this cold, clammy, just kind of a, uh, just I can't, I'm, I'm having a hard time keeping my thoughts going and whatever else. There's a demonic spirit in these new versions, a spirit of Antichrist. And if you listen to anybody that's reading from a new version, 
for any reason at all, that's a problem. It's a big problem. We need to be afraid of messing with this book. This book is the most precious possession that you have as a Christian. Don't ever give it up. Don't ever change it. It's another way of giving up your King James Bible, by the way. It isn't just, you know, someday you're there at, the, at your house and, and there's a, the door kicks in and these troops come in and they say, we're the new Catholic Inquisition and give us your King James Bible and they hold you at gunpoint, you know, and you, and you have to, they steal your King James Bible. That's one way, that's the way most people think of your Bible being taken from you. Uh, but there's a more sinister way. And that is your Bible can be taken from you, number one, by having it replaced with a new version. That's the number one way that the devil will get you. I should say, not should, shouldn't say what number one way, but that's one way he can. The second way is, even more subtle, more slick, is to get you to use the King James Bible and not believe it. And just say it's just a translation. No translation can be inspired. There are areas where it could be translated a little bit more literal, a little bit more whatever. My pastor says that it should be translated a little bit different. If I want to continue going to my church, I have to kind of take a stand that's not quite so militant for the King James Bible because it's divisive. <laughs> you better get straightened out. Nobody alive today has any excuse to use the new versions. All right? Maybe if they're just brand new saved and they're using one or something like that, but God's going to get them to the King James Bible quickly. I can't tell you how many people that uh, I've seen uh, pick up the King James Bible and use the King James Bible and believe it because of this ministry. Uh, no idea. I don't even ca keep track. <laughs> no idea. But it's been a lot over the years. And if you're not using the King James Bible, I suggest that you watch my Real Bible Version Issue Exposed uh, video or some of the other stuff I've done on the new versions and things. Or uh, go to chick.com and look up some of the articles, uh, stuff that David Daniels put out and whatever else. There's some good stuff out there on the Bible version issue. Totally debunking any of the arguments that the new version people come out with. And they just keep on coming out with it and coming out with it and coming out with it. So I've said enough. I could rant and rant and rant about this thing. It just it makes my blood boil to see people messing with God's book and just no fear at all. When there's a very clear warning in the back of the Bible about adding to or subtracting from. And it says your part's taken out of the book of life. I believe in eternal security. I believe it. I teach it. I preach it. But I'll tell you what. I have enough fear of God to know He doesn't want His book messed with. I pray you have that same fear. Thank you for watching.